let's discuss extraction of zinc so first things first what are the main ores of zinc we have two calamine this is essentially zinc carbonate and two zinc blend this is zinc sulfide now one thing i would like you to note is this in most cases whenever you have ores containing zinc sulfide you're also going to have lead to sulfide now lead to sulfide is commonly referred to as galena now galena is uh, actually the main ore for extraction of lead metal but in this case since we are focused on extraction of zinc this is going to act as an impurity a contaminant you know we don't want it here so let's dive into it there are three main steps that are involved in extraction of zinc step number one concentration of the ore number two roasting number three the actual extraction process so starting with the concentration of the ore, as mentioned before, these ores come with impurities. These impurities are mostly in form of other minerals and metals. So what needs to happen is that you need to concentrate the ore by removing as many impurities as possible. Now, in most cases, this is done through a method known as froth flotation. Now, I'm not going to discuss this method in this video because this is something that I've already discussed in my past video, specifically the one that deals with extraction of copper. So be sure to check it out. Now, after these impurities have been reduced, we can move on to the next step, and that is roasting. Now, roasting is simply a process whereby you're heating a substance in the presence of air, of course, under very high temperatures. Now, this occurs within a structure that is known as a furnace. So in this case, let's imagine we have both. We have calamine and zinc blend. Now, if you were to heat the calamine, what will happen is that it's going to decompose. Remember when it comes to carbonates, if you heat most carbonates, with the exception of potassium and sodium carbonates, they are going to decompose to break down. So zinc carbonate is going to break down, leading to the formation of zinc oxide plus carbon-4 oxide. What about the zinc blend? If you roast zinc sulfide, you know the zinc blend, it's going to react with oxygen, leading to the formation of zinc oxide plus sulfur-4 oxide. So are you seeing what these two reactions have in common? We have now attained zinc 2 oxide and we can now start with the actual extraction process. Now one thing I would like to mention is this, the lead 2 sulfide, you know the galena that is present will also be roasted because duh, it's there. So it's going to react with oxygen leading to the formation of lead 2 oxide plus sulfur 4 oxide. Now I'm going to come back to this point, tell you how this is extracted. But as of now, we have zinc oxide and we can now start with the extraction process, you know, the removal of zinc metal from the oxide. Now, this can be done through two ways. Number one, by reduction with carbon and number two, through electrolysis. So let's start with the first one, reduction by carbon. Now, carbon is a non-metal, but it's more reactive than zinc and therefore it can actually be used to reduce zinc oxide. So this process takes place in a blast furnace. Now a blast furnace is, you know, a furnace, you know, that is used for smelting of metals. So smelting of metals is whereby you're having extraction of metals from their ores through heating under very high temperatures. So this is done within a structure that looks like this, you know, a furnace. So the zinc oxide is going to be mixed with coke, and limestone so you're going to have a mixture containing these three components zinc oxide coke coke is essentially carbon by the way and limestone which is calcium carbonate so each of these three has a role that it plays okay it's obvious what the zinc oxide is uh, here for i mean we are extracting zinc from it but as we move on with the discussion we are going to learn what the role of coke and limestone is now these three are then combined together and then fed into the furnace from the top as such there so once they enter the furnace, this is where you have temperatures that are very high. In fact, they're going to be more than 1000 degrees Celsius. So the carbon is going to act as a reducing agent. Now, as I stated before, carbon is more reactive than zinc metal. Now guys, imagine you have zinc oxide and carbon. What do you think will happen? Carbon is going to reduce the zinc oxide. So essentially, it's going to reduce the zinc oxide and become oxidized itself. Okay, so zinc oxide and carbon. So the carbon is going to be oxidized to form carbon 2 oxide. Zinc is going to be reduced to zinc metal. So we have zinc metal. Yay! 
Now, the carbon two oxide gas that is produced is actually an advantage in this process because it's going to act as another reducing agent. So this is our second reducing agent. Now, carbon two oxide is also going to reduce some of the zinc oxide to form zinc and carbon four oxide. So we have two reducing agents here, carbon and carbon two oxide. I want you to take a look at the questions and note the state in which the zinc metal is in. It's in gaseous state. Now, the reason is because the zinc is in vapor form. The boiling point of zinc metal is 913 degrees Celsius. So if you have temperatures above this, zinc metal is going to be in vapor form, in gaseous state. Now, what are the temperatures within the furnace? Above 1000 degrees Celsius. Now, it's going to move out of the furnace and into the condenser. Within the condenser, you're going to have temperatures that are around 600 degrees Celsius. Okay, let's pause there. What did we say the boiling point of zinc was? 913 degrees Celsius. What about the melting point of zinc? This is 420 degrees Celsius. So any temperature above 420 degrees Celsius, you're going to have the zinc melting, you know, becoming a liquid. So above 420, liquid state. Going on to the boiling point, boiling point of zinc is 913. So any temperature above 913 and you're going to have zinc in gaseous state. So if you have temperatures between 420 and 913, you're going to have zinc in liquid state. So the temperatures that are maintained within the condenser are around 600 degrees Celsius. So this makes it ideal for the zinc to condense to liquid state. Now the zinc vapor is sprayed with molten lead within the condenser. Now molten lead is simply lead in liquid state, hence the term spread. Now this serves two purposes. Number one is that it helps in condensation of the vapor. You know, it helps the zinc vapor to turn to liquid. Another function is that it also prevents reoxidation of the zinc vapor. So what happens is that the molten lead surrounds the zinc vapor and acts as a barrier. It reduces the direct contact of zinc with oxygen and therefore it prevents reoxidation of zinc. You know, it prevents zinc from combining with oxygen to form zinc oxide. I mean, guys, we were there. We don't want to go back. So we want zinc to remain as zinc and therefore the spraying with the molten lead. Now, once the zinc has liquefied, we're going to have a mixture containing molten zinc and molten lead. But this is not going to be a problem. Why? Because these are two totally different metals that have different densities. Molten lead is denser than molten zinc. So what will happen is that the zinc, you know, being lighter, is going to separate and settle above the molten lead. Now, it's then going to be collected and so on. And we are done. There we have it. There we have our molten zinc. Congratulations. Okay, going back to our mixture, you know, the mixture that was fed on top of the furnace, which consisted of zinc oxide, coke, and limestone. So we've discussed zinc oxide and coke. What about limestone? What is its role? So limestone is simply calcium carbonate. Now, when calcium carbonate is exposed to the very high temperatures within the furnace, it decomposes, leading to the formation of calcium oxide and carbon-4 oxide. Now, calcium oxide is the one that is needed here. So, what it does is that it combines with silica. So, silica is simply silicon-4 oxide. This tends to be one of the more common impurities that are found in ores. So, yes, it's also going to be present here and we need to find a way to remove it. And that is where calcium oxide comes in. It combines with the silica, leading to the formation of calcium silicate. This, of course, is removed as slag, you know, as a waste product. Are we done? Okay, almost, almost. We are done with the first part, you know, reduction by carbon. There's just one thing I would like to mention. Remember the galena, the lead to sulfide? which was roasted, leading to the formation of lead 2 oxide and sulfur 4 oxide. So what will happen is that the lead 2 oxide will also be reduced in the furnace. It's going to be reduced by the carbon, leading to the formation of lead metal. So the molten lead is then going to move to the bottom of the furnace, where it's then going to be tapped off, you know, just collected. Next one is electrolysis. So if we have zinc oxide and we want to extract zinc metal from it, this can also be done through electrolysis. What is electrolysis? So this is a process whereby you're going to pass an electric current 
through a substance in order to bring about its decomposition, you know, its breakdown. And yes, we want to break it down so that we can extract zinc metal from it. So can we electrolyze zinc to oxide? Unfortunately, not. Number one, for electrolysis to take place, we need to have mobile ions so that they can conduct the electric current. Therefore, either the zinc oxide should be number one molten or dissolved in a solvent. Now, zinc oxide has a very high melting point, something close to 2000 degrees Celsius. So it's going to require a lot of energy, a lot of electricity to melt it, which is not viable. I mean, like, seriously, this is not practical. What about dissolving it in a solvent? Yes, that can be done, but zinc oxide is almost insoluble in water. You know, it doesn't dissolve well in water. So water cannot be used. But the good thing is that it does dissolve in dilute acids such as sulfuric acid. So what will happen is that you're going to dissolve the zinc oxide in dilute sulfuric acid. So it's going to react with the acid leading to the formation of zinc sulfate plus water. The zinc sulfate will then be dissolved in water to form a solution which will then be electrolyzed. Now, let's have our electrodes. Remember, in an electrolytic setup such as this, you have electrodes. You have the anode and the cathode. Now, when tackling questions regarding electrolysis, these are three important mnemonics that you need to remember if you find the information regarding the anode and the cathode confusing. So we have red cut and ox and panic. Now, PANIC stands for positive is anode, negative is cathode. So the anode is the positive electrode, while the cathode is the negative electrode. At the anode is where we are going to have negatively charged ions. Why? Because opposites attract. So if the anode is a positive electrode, it's going to attract negatively charged ions. So over here, we're going to have hydroxide ions and sulfate ions. The cathode is the negative electrode so it's going to attract positively charged ions specifically zinc ions and hydrogen ions now in case you're wondering where the hydrogen ions and hydroxide ions are coming from these are coming from the water that was used to dissolve zinc sulfate coming back to the two remaining mnemonics red cut at the cathode is where reduction takes place. So reduction is gaining of electrons. So whatever ions are discharged at the cathode, they are going to gain electrons. At the anode is where oxidation takes place. So this is where the ions are going to lose electrons. Now between hydroxide ions and sulfate ions at the anode, you're going to have discharge of the hydroxide ions. So they're going to be discharged, leading to the formation of oxygen gas and water. And that is the half equation. At the cathode, you're going to have zinc ions being discharged. So the zinc ions are going to gain electrons to form zinc metal. You know, pure zinc metal, this is going to be deposited on the cathode. Now, at regular intervals, you're going to have this uh, zinc metal being stripped off, you know, being removed from the cathode. And at this point, we have attained pure zinc metal through the electrolytic method. One thing I would like to mention, and that is very important, is the type of anode and cathode used. The anode consists of aluminium sheets. The cathode consists of lead containing 1% silver. So 99% lead and 1% silver. Now, in case you're wondering, hey, this is very specific. Yes, the type of electrode or the nature of the electrode used is very important because it determines the products that are obtained at the electrode. Now, if graphite electrodes were used, what will happen is that at the cathode, you're going to have hydrogen ions being discharged instead of zinc ions. Why? Because zinc is higher than hydrogen in the electrochemical series. In short, hydrogen ions have a greater tendency to gain electrons than zinc ions. Now, this is just normal, you know, with the graphite electrons. But we don't want hydrogen ions to be discharged. I mean, why are we even doing this? We want zinc metal. So that means something needs to be done to ensure that it's not hydrogen ions that are discharged, but zinc ions. And that is where the electrodes come in. So you're going to have a cathode that is made up of 99% lead, 1% silver to ensure that it's the zinc ions that are discharged leading to the deposition of zinc metal and not hydrogen ions. And that brings us to the end of this lesson. By the way, I have 
more than 10 videos on extraction of metals. So there are six metals in our syllabus. I have at this point discussed all of them. I even have videos specifically discussing past KCC questions on specific metals. Be sure to check them out. All the best.